of the uh, workshop that we'll have first a few talks and then we will move to the open forum at the end. In the chat box, I left there the link to the pin board where you can drop any comments, suggestion, or any idea that you are now having during the workshop, so feel completely free. You also can check there the great digital posters that we have for the workshop. And now we have the first talk of this second part, uh, which is uh, Simon Morley from British Antarctic Survey. So Simon, please uh, start whenever you want. The floor is your, yours, you have five minutes. Great, thank you very much, Juan, and thank you for inviting me to um, talk at this session. Um, as you see, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the work that's being done from Rubber Research Station, and this is the long-term monitoring work, and some of the results and, and findings we've come up with in the last sort of few years, um, based on the fact that we've got these long-term data sets and can start making inferences about what's driving um, communities in this system. So you can see where it's situated on the WAP. Um, and the key really is that it's in the marginal sea ice zone where the sea freezes over winter and then um, melts out over summer. And that duration has changed and is one of the biggest signals of climate change in, this, in that part of the world. Um, so we're very lucky to have 23 years worth of oceanographic modeling, uh, monitoring from the system um, year round um, in the picture, I show them out taking a CTD through the ice. Apparently, the ice has just formed enough for them to go out and start cutting holes to continue that work through the winter. Started by Andy Clark, now run by Mike Meredith and Hugh Venables, but 23 years worth of data on variability in the system. And um, even more information than that on the ecophysiology, the ecology and physiology of the animals. And now we can start to pair the two together and start to understand how that variability in the environment has led to the, the ecology and the physiology patterns we're seeing in the animals. Um, and one particular example here is again these monthly collections of animals for reproductive status. You can see three of the nine species here, the limpet, the sea star, and in the bottom panel there you can see the, the holothurians, the sea cucumbers poking up. They're collected every month and then their reproductive allocation is assessed so we can start to understand how the environment, which has influenced their physiology, um, is then influencing the energy that's available for reproduction um, and start to kind of find the patterns and understand how the, the changes in the system um, are affecting these animals. Because it's so variable in the short term, um, particularly uh, through the years, having that long-term data series, being able to pick out um, El Nino influences and so effects down there allows us to pick up the signals from the longer term change. And we do a lot of monitoring of the animals on the sea floor. So if we look at the top row first, in the left top there is a, a, is a picture of a quarter square meter of the sea floor, a rocky community living on rocks with silt in between. Um, one of the main projects monitoring the effect of iceberg impact on the animals living on the seafloor, the iceberg impact group, you can see in the middle top picture, the diver assessing whether the concrete blocks have been broken. And these are in five by five grids, nine of them at three different depths. And these have been run since 2002. And for the last 10 years, each meter squared, um, the blocks are removed and replaced in exactly the same position. So we know the disturbance history of each meter squared within those grids. Then on top right, you see um, Terry Suster um, with a homemade suction device sucking animals out of her quadrat to assess the biodiversity on the steeper, uh, more rocky, even rockier shores. Then in the bottom row, also the work on the soft sediment, you'll see uh, me in the bottom left there, taking sediment samples. In the middle, you'll see the suction sampler sucking out all of the sediment out of a, out of a quadrat and through a mesh so we can collect the, the macro and the megafauna. And then on the right from this season, um, some of the work we did with one of Kate Hendry's postdocs collecting sediment um, to look at nutrients. And we've also collected that sediment to look at um, to look at meta metagenomics and so some of the some of the animals that we can't collect with our diver collections. Um, so if I show you here, close up again of Rogera, you'll see the blue circles, one in Hanger Cove, 
one in South Cove, as we call it, north and south of the station. Um, and these were sites and depths at 20 meters. So this was where the soft sediment communities were sampled. The green box I've put in is approximately where the Ibis grids are. Um, it's slightly shrunk because I didn't want to cover the South Cove name, but that's where the iceberg disturbance grid is. Um, clearly iceberg disturbance as the, the sea ice duration changes, icebergs get trapped by the sea ice, are not moving around as much when the sea ice is of shorter duration, the icebergs are moving around more, and so you're getting greater disturbance of the seafloor. So you're starting to see quite dramatic changes um, in, in the communities on there. And we have many projects through Dave Barnes working on that. And then the kind of orange bar off the southern end of the station where it drops away into deep water. Um, that's where, oh, what have I done? Fair, isn't it? Um, that's where um, the suction sampler, um, this study was done by Terry. So if we go into just a couple of results from this, you can see this is an NMDS plot and you can see how Hanger Cove and South Cove are quite separated out. Hanger Cove the triangles, South Cove the circles. Um, this difference was there's a greater um, abundance of animals in Hanger Cove, so density is higher. Uh, the species riches is higher in South Cove and you can see some of the species that separate them out. You could also see the outlier at the top there, the Hanger Cove Blue Triangle, um, which was a much shallower um, sediment quadrat and it had very, very different animals in it. Lots of um, scavenging amphipods and we think there must have been a carcass or something in that, in that sample that um, skewed the, the, the assemblage that we were seeing. Um, but we found no interannual or seasonal differences in this study. This study went on for a year and a half um, with a break and then another summer. And so we found no interannual or seasonal differences, which is maybe not surprising in these mega and macro faunal communities um, as they're long lived animals, individuals in the system. And then some of Terry's data. So she, did, she took samples across the depth, six, 12 and 20 meters. And again, you can see quite clearly, you can see, well, first off, you can see how the uh, species richness increases with depth. And second off, you can see how there were no summer or winter differences. So they're stable across the years and across the seasons. So in the short term, we've got a pretty good idea of what's there. So we can then start to compare, you know, across five, 10, 20 year timescales to see how any changes in iceberg disturbance impact has affected the communities that we see. Um, on the shore. And so if we just focus in on the importance of mobility on the resilience of communities against disturbance. So if we look at the soft, soft substratum there, the picture on the left shows a, a small iceberg scour. You can see the hollow and the ridges of sediment around it. Um, in Bell's study, it was a qualitative assessment of iceberg impact, not like the iceberg disturbance grid, not to that level but she found no, no actual effect or a signal of iceberg disturbance on the communities. And uh, it's been hypothesized before by Lloyd, but this also, um, this also confirmed that, that actually within the sediment, the animals are much more mobile and be able to actually, in, to a certain extent, they'll be buffered against the impact of the iceberg by the soft sediment. And secondarily, they'll be able to migrate back into these patches of sediment from areas outside it. And that's also the case with the, the, the megafauna on the surface coming in very quickly to feed and scavenge on the iceberg scale. And then this is a, a bit more complicated. Um, this is the structural equation modeling of Ben Robinson based on the iceberg disturbance grid. So we look at the bottom recovery age. So that's the time since that particular grid square was last impacted. And if you look at the animals in this one, Odontastomalidus, the sea star, and the Celecancina, the, the limpet, they were not affected by time since last impact. These are mobile species, not affected by time since last impact. But if you look at local disturbance, so if there's been an iceberg impact around that square, you can see that that does impact the number of these limpets and sea stars that are available to migrate back into this patch very quickly after the iceberg impact. 
And then if you look at background disturbance, so that's the disturbance over the whole of the grid, you can see that higher disturbance um, does, does reduce overall species richness because there are fewer species in the overall environment to recruit back into the area. Um, but you can see that background disturbance actually does tend to increase overall the number of nacelle. There's mobile species that move very quickly back into the area that's been, that's been damaged. And so this is a very quick run through just to show you um, how, how mobility uh, is important. And of course, mobility also includes dispersal in terms of larval dispersal. And you get very different patterns for the, the sessile species, the bryozoans in particular, um, which you can see in Ben's paper. Um, so just to summarize that, um, because we have this massive um, long-term data set, and it's a data set that's not only um, collected by the British Antarctic Survey, there are many, many collaborators both within the UK and internationally who are working on that system and providing great benefit and extra information on that. Um, but you can see from this just snapshot the importance of the dispersal capacity on the resilience of these assemblages, um, both mobility and larval dispersal. Um, the ability to do this long-term research year-round, um, multidiscipline and also multi-program with all of these collaborators means we have a very, very powerful sort of system to work on. And of course, feeding that into these initiatives such as SUS we're in now, but postcard MISO, et cetera. Um, will hopefully lead to um, a much better understanding of what's controlling biodiversity. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, uh, Simon, for a great talk and stressing how important international collaboration and these programs are. Uh, we are running out of time for the questions, so if you may, Simon, you can the career researcher at Centro Austral de Investigaciones Científicas in Argentina. And I am also part of a big group of investigation where we deal with, uh, or we try to, to understand and comprehend what's uh, going on in marine ecosystem structure, function and stability. Uh, um, so this very short talk is uh, supposed to be a review of most of the of the recent papers and, and doctoral thesis uh, that we had uh, published and, and in, in that path of publishing of the recent years, particularly of uh, marine ecosystem in the West Antarctic Peninsula, and that ecosystem is the well-known Potter Cove in Isla 25 de Mayo or King George Island in the South Shetland archipelago. And that's where the most important Argentinian scientific base is located. Uh, Potter Cove, you might know, is a fjord-like ecosystem. It's uh, characterized by a very high biodiversity. It's a hotspot of biodiversity. And it's also characterized like most of the coastal uh, environments in the West Antarctic Peninsula by a very important uh, environmental force that is the glacier retreat. There you can see how the, the glacier, forked glacier has been retreating since the 1950s. Uh, so I'm going to, to focus on, on five main findings that we made uh, by applying a network approach to, to this particular ecosystem, Potter Cove. So the first um, 
The first finding has to do with the complexity of the food web. We have heard many times that uh, Antarctica as a, as a, a whole environment uh, holds a simple or, or, or food chain, what is uh, actually known. But actually, uh, Antarctic ecosystems, uh, West Antarctic ecosystems, hold really complex food webs. And, and we have shown that in Potter Cove ecosystem. So there you can see the food web and all the interactions, the trophic interactions among the species. Uh, so particularly Potter Cove food web is a comprised of more than 90 species and more than 300 trophic interactions. And among these species and interactions, there, are, uh, there is a pattern where most of the species have few interactions and few species uh, participate in many interactions. Uh, are an amphipode, Pondogene Antarctica, uh, an echinoderm, Ophionotus victoriae, and uh, the marcel fish, Natotenia coriceps. So these are the three species that are participating in most of the interactions in this particular food web. The second finding has to do with the um, with structural pattern that is uh, normally studied in complex ecological networks, and that's the small worm pattern. So one of the findings that we have done by approaching this ecosystem with a network perspective was that Potter Cove food web does not uh, present this particular structural pattern. And that means dynamically that the food web will not be fragile against the extinction of most connected species, like the ones I have just uh, talked about. And because of the distance uh, in terms of interactions between species in this food web, uh, we suggest a rapid spread of a perturbation throughout the network. The third finding has to do with the stability and some uh, extinction simulations that we have done focusing on the macroalgae uh, community. So what's the influence of the macroalgae perturbations uh, on the whole food web? And we have found uh, that the food web, uh, Potocov ecosystem is uh, relatively robust to macroalgae perturbations. And this has to do with the functional redundancy. So on your right, you can see a graph that connects the prey species uh, among those uh, predators that are shared by. And it's also important to, to remark that these changes in the macroalgae uh, community and also throughout the network will not be detected until most of the macroalgae species are affected. So this is what these uh, extinction simulations suggest to us. The fourth finding has to do with the organization of uh, the ecosystem. So we suggest that uh, this ecosystem is organized in a spatial manner. So Potter Cove is, uh, has a soft bottom in the internal part closer to the coast and a hard bottom in the external area of the cove. So the, the latter one, the external cove, is dominated by macroalga species. So uh, the, the, the source of energy there is uh, macroalgae. So that's why we suggest a green food web for that, uh, for that area of the cove. And on the other hand, we suggest uh, that in the internal cove where the soft bottom dominates, the detritus is the main source of energy for the food web and the higher trophic levels. As a last finding, we also uh, were trying to, to incorporate into uh, the ecological studies uh, non-trophic interactions. So there's a lot of theory talking about the importance of non-trophic interactions in the stability of the of, of ecosystems. And here we have a uh, we have found that most of these non-trophic interactions uh, are related to uh, the fish and amphipods community. And that's because uh, within the, the fish functional group and within the amphipod functional group, most of these species have uh, 
a diet overlapped. So our take home message uh, uh, is, is that uh, we have found a lot of interesting um, suggestions and, and findings regarding the structure, the stability and the dynamics of a particular marine ecosystem in the Western Antarctic Peninsula. And, and this will obviously be a, a powerful tool to analyze the, the impact of climate change on them. And as a, as a very uh, humble uh, proposal for the forum discussion, uh, I think that this perspective uh, where we also consider the interactions among species and not only the abundance and the, and the distribution especially will, will be a, a powerful and, and, a, and a novel uh, approach where we can find and study how these communities are responding. So thank you very much. If, if you have any questions, uh, please. And Thank you, Thomas, time. for, for a great presentation. Uh, we have time for one question, if there is one. Okay, well, if not, we will uh, keep them for afterwards. And now we will move to the next uh, talk. Uh, let me check. The next one is also about food webs, and it will be Oscar who will take now the floor. So, Oscar. If you can put it in full presentation mode. There, perfect. Uh, whenever you want. I should unmute. So uh, I'm going to follow up on Thomas's talk and talk about the Palmer LTER. Um, I'm just one representing many. Um, I'm going to give some updates on the LTR. We're going through our renewal process right now, and we're really excited because we have some new members, Carlos Moffat, um, the brilliant physical oceanographer you just heard, uh, Megan Semino, uh, working with the penguins, and Ben Van Moy looking at lipidomics and sort of biological energy of the system as a whole. And so our conceptual model has been that um, sort of cross-shore fluxes of heat associated with the Antarctic circumpolar current is topographically steered and sets up biological hotspots along the West Antarctic Peninsula. And that what we see is a climate gradient across the WAP. Up in the north, we're sort of in transition to a subpolar system associated with a lot of heat from the ACC. And that leads to a more marine ecosystem and a lot more remineralization of organic carbon and the lower carbon flux, as opposed to if you go further south, where you have a, uh, a sea ice system, essentially setting up a shallower mixed layer depth, strong diatom driven organic pulses of carbon. And one of the things we're really gonna focus on in the coming uh, next six years is sort of the different forcing functions. So you've got the long-term climate press of the warming that we're all interested in. Then we have these decadal press pulses. Um, I'll give you an example of that. And then we're gonna add synoptic scales, which is really um, high intensity storms that seem to play a large role in structuring some of the upper trophic levels. Um, this is sort of the local scale climate press forcing that we see at Palmer Station. Um, you can see up in the top panel, sort of the SAM and ENSO forcing. Um, in the recent years, from like 2009 for just about eight years, there was a large uh, recovery of sea ice. And it happened to be when the SAM and ENSO were um, in phase with each other. Um, that is now sort of uh, going back to the normal decline that we've been seeing in the past. Um, associated with the decreasing sea ice, we do see an increasing phytoplankton at Palmer Station. And if you squint really hard, you can see the, the krill increase, especially during the recent ice event. Um, and then you can see the long-term trajectory of the penguins with the decline in the Adeles and the rise of the chinstraps and gentoos. Um, and so 
Uh, that's sort of what you see at the local scale. Um, do we see that at the regional scale um, during our cruises every January? And for the most part, yes. Um, you can see on your left-hand side there, the upper mix layer of the ocean for the summer. Um, and it's been generally declining, especially in the further south waters near Adelaide and Charcot Island. Associated with that shallowing mix layer depth, we see an increasing uh, amount of chlorophyll A and increased drawdown of CO2 into the ocean. Um, and so the mixed layer depth seems to regulate sort of the, much of the phytoplankton blooms. Um, and then that in turn regulates the PCO2. I want to emphasize that, um, you know, it's not only the amount of phytoplankton present that dominates the uh, amount of CO2 being drawn into the ocean, it's the type. Um, we saw, you know, from earlier talks, the importance of diatoms versus cryptophytes. And, you know, essentially, if you have a big diatom bloom, it's going to be the most efficient of sucking carbon into the water, uh, that more efficient than the cryptophytes and mixed flagellates, which in our database is sort of the dominant players. If you go to decadal press pulse sort of forcing, which really is sort of the phasing of the uh, ENSO and SAM uh, things, what we do see is you can see the sea ice um, generally has shown decline, but you can see from the 2010 on um, the increase that was associated with that. And that plays a large role in modulating the summer mixed layer depth. And then that ripples through the food web. Um, and so when you do change that food web, what do you see? Um, you see three stars there. The upper star represents Carlina. Uh, the Argentinian base, you've got the US based Palmer Station, and then Rothford and the UK base. For the two northern areas that have been in this transition into a subpolar state, you can see that when the sea ice comes back, there was a large uh, increase in chlorophyll. Rothered, which we still consider sort of more of a traditional uh, polar system, um, had a different response. You did see some chlorophyll increases. Um, but not to the same effect we saw in the north. And so as you have these decadal pushes that modulate the physics, you see it ripple into the plants. Um, does that translate into the krill? Um, there are some significant correlations between the amount of uh, phytoplankton. Most, the most easiest way to see it is actually in the primary productivity, the C14 uptake rates, much less than the phytoplankton biomass. And you know, just like when we talk about these decadal processes, you see these cyclical patterns of high recruitment years in Euphausia superba. And this is data across the entire uh, continental shelf of the West Antarctic Peninsula. And you can also notice that there's different dynamics than other krill species. Um, e. crystal aphorus. I cannot pronounce that for the life of me. Um, and you see that there is uh, differences whether you talk about the north the south and the far south sort of Charcot Island, which um, we have much less data simply because it's still ice covered enough, we rarely get to it despite great effort. And so then the final sort of disturbances we're gonna be looking at over the next few years are synoptic pulses. And what we've been noticing, especially for penguins, this is work with uh, Megan Semino and Bill Frazier, um, that when you have large intense uh, storms, um, you'll actually see penguin chick weights decline. And so we believe it's sort of uh, the metabolic cake, the metabolic cost of riding out the storms. And it could reflect um, a variety of factors from the parents spending less time gathering food to sort of a thermal regulatory cost as a lot of the storms we see um, are becoming wetter over time, especially Palmer North. And I just throw this in, this is a reanalysis showing the number of storms over a year and the number of storms in the Palmer region um, has a very messy but slight positive increase. And so we tend to explore, um, we want to explore that process and get a better handle on what are those costs that then impact the chick fly blooms. So that is a super uh, quick overview of the LTR of where we've been.
and where we hope to go. And that's what I got. Thank Oscar for a great presentation. I don't know if there is, we have time for one question, if there is one. Maybe all as I am, we are impressed of how many data and everything <laughs> there is. So, well, if not, uh, we will keep that in mind. You can drop an email or a question in the chat box. And if not, we will move to the next one, which I think is also about traffic interaction. In this case, it's about Krill. So Kim Bernard is going to do this next, next talk.